and I will now introduce tonight's topic and our speakers. There's one very brave woman in Britain tonight who I hope uh, might be listening to our discussion, and that's Baroness Heather Hallett, a former Court of Appeal judge who has agreed to chair the COVID inquiry. <laughs> we should all salute her. It will be one of the most complex inquiries in legal history and highly charged politically, with 150,000 deaths so far and the pandemic far from over. Tonight, we brought together three speakers involved with previous high profile inquiries, and perhaps some of them still bearing the scars. In the order in which they're going to speak, they are Lord Phillips, chair of the BSE inquiry, that was 20 years ago now, from 1998 to 2000. Margaret Aldred, who was secretary to the Iraq, Iraq inquiry, chaired by the late Sir John Chilcott, that sat from 2009 to 2016. And lastly, Sir Brian Leveson, chair of the inquiry into press regulation, which sat from 2011 to 2012. And between them, they are going to pool advice for Heather Hallett on how best to set up a complex inquiry. Each of them will talk for five minutes at the start, and we'll then have a discussion between the four of us for 30 minutes or so before we open it up to Q&A. Put your questions in the Q&A feature as soon as you like so that Abby can start collecting them. But please be understanding if your question is not selected, we may not be able to answer them all. And the seminar will end at the latest by 6.15. So let me now invite Lord Phillips to tell us about the BSE inquiry. Nicholas, over to you. Thank you. Um, in 1986, the first case of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE for short, or commonly known as mad cow disease, was identified in England. This is an inevitably fatal disease that deforms the proteins in the brain. Its incidence in cattle spread rapidly and stringent measures were taken to deal with it, including culling infected herds. The Conservative government appointed an expert committee to advise whether there was a risk that the disease could pass to humans as a result of eating beef from infected animals. This committee reported that the risk was remote and the government passed this view on to the general public. But the view was wrong. And in 1995, the first death was identified of a man who had contracted the human equivalent new variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD as a result of eating beef. Many felt that they had been deceived by the government as to the risk that this might happen. Further measures were put in place to counter this new and hideous danger. At the end of 1997, the incoming Labour government set up a non-statutory public inquiry to reach conclusions as to the adequacy of its predecessor's response to the emergence, first of all of the cattle disease and then of the human disease. I agreed to chair this. The government was sensitive to the possible suggestion that the inquiry was politically motivated, to the extent that when I sought to meet the Minister of Agriculture to discuss the objectives of the inquiry, he declined to see me. I was provided with two assessors, June Bridgman, a retired senior civil servant, and Professor Malcolm Ferguson Smith, a distinguished geneticist. One of the first things I did was to obtain agreement that they should be full members of the tribunal so that I could delegate to them the writing of appropriate sections of the report. I appointed as counsel to the tribunal, Paul Walker, then a senior junior counsel in my chambers, he just returned from a sabbatical teaching public law in New Zealand, and he proved to be an inspired choice. My terms of reference included a requirement to report within a year. This was not realistic, and I twice had to go crawling back to the cabinet secretary to ask for more time. In the end, we needed nearly three years. We were looking at 10 years of government activity. The weight of the documents was so great that we had to have the inquiry building surveyed to make sure that it was adequate to bear the weight. <laughs> we engaged a huge team of young people, 
many of them Commonwealth students earning money to fund their year off to digest all these documents. We divided the inquiry into two halves. The first was devoted exclusively to fact finding. We then had a break while we digested this. And in the light of it, we sent out so-called salmon letters informing um, witnesses of the possibility that they would be criticized and inviting them back uh, to deal with that potential. This provoked indignant protests from some of the scientists who felt that it was a poor reward for advising the government pro bono. We did not give counsel acting for witnesses the right to examine or cross-examine without first seeking permission and explaining the subject of the um, examination they wished to conduct. We did not, in fact, have a single request from counsel to examine or cross-examine. Those who contracted CJD as a result of eating beef were doomed to die. I visited one in hospital and relatives of some gave evidence, but there was not a vociferous victim lobby. All hearings were public and all evidence was published. At the press conference on publication of the report, Joshua Rosenberg, as was his wont, asked the first question. Why was my report such a whitewash? It is true that we absolved some who with hindsight had got things wrong on the basis that their conduct had fallen within the bounds of what was reasonable, having regard to the knowledge at the time. But our report certainly contained criticism. Government had repeatedly stated that there is no evidence that BSE is transmissible to human beings, which the public reasonably found reassuring. What they should have said was, we do not yet know whether BSE is transmissible to humans, though this does not seem likely. I understand that to this day, civil servants are now warned against using the formula. There is no evidence that. Our report ran to 11 volumes. Volume one was a summary of the other 10 volumes and chapter one of volume one was an executive summary of the lot. That inquiry put me under pressure that I had never experienced before and never experienced since. I found it intensely stressful. It's the only period of my life when I did not enjoy my work. And I think I came quite close to cracking under the strain. I mentioned at the beginning that some of you might still bear the scars of your inquiry. <laughs> um, Margaret, tell us about your experience um, as secretary to the uh, Iraq inquiry. Thank you. Um, and I um, should say that I'm sure John would be here um, instead of me if he could have been, um, but um, he's a sad loss. Um, he was a very, very nice man to work for. Um, the Iraq inquiry uh, was a response to the continuing public concern about the events leading up to the UK involvement in the invasion of Iraq in March 2003 and the subsequent actions um, of the UK in Iraq in the following six years. It was announced on the 15th of June 2009 by the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who described it as a process to learn the lessons um, of the complex and often controversial events in Iraq. Um, he envisaged that it would examine the period from the summer of 2001 um, until the withdrawal of UK troops from Iraq, which took place in July 2009. Um, and he wanted it to be a lessons learned um, account, um, which he said in each and every area, which um, had rather significant um, implications for the amount of work for the inquiry. Um, it was originally envisaged that like the Franks inquiry into the um, Falklands um, campaign and the, well, the Argentine invasion of the Falklands and the Butler inquiry into the intelligence on weapons of mass destruction, that it would be held in private um, as a Privy Council inquiry. And I might come back to that and what the implications were later. Um, as Sir John Chilcott made clear, um, including in a letter to the then Prime Minister in, in June, later in June, um, it very quickly became clear from the response that that simply wasn't a tenable position. And John had been involved in the um, Butler inquiry into um, 
intelligence on WMD. And he made it very clear uh, and wrote to the Prime Minister on the 21st of June, making it clear that he intended to hear witnesses in public um, wherever possible, and that he would publish as much of the evidence that the, that the inquiry was given um, alongside the report as could be agreed. And that followed consultation um, with the main opposition parties and with the heads of some of the relevant um, select committees who had made it clear that what they wanted to know was what had happened and the evidence behind it. In his launch statement, um, John said that, for the inquiry, John said that we will be considering the UK's involvement in Iraq, including the way decisions were made and the actions taken to establish as accurately and reliably as possible what had happened and to identify the lessons to be learned. Um, it was an unusual inquiry because I think there's only been four Privy Council inquiries in the last 40 years. Um, one set up subsequent to the Iraq inquiry into the handling of detainees. Um, and they're a format which the government has used for um, issues where the evidence is um, extremely sensitive for national security reasons. And the key point I think is that the government retains ownership of all the information given to the inquiry um, until the inquiry negotiates and agrees what, may it, what it may use publicly and disclose. Uh, and that had implications for the way in which we work. Um, it was a committee of five privy councillors, um, John and four others, um, Sir Rod Lyne, Baroness Usha Prashar, Professor Sir Laurie Friedman, and Sir Martin Gilbert, who sadly died during the course of the inquiry. Uh, they were described by the Prime Minister as non-partisan public figures, acknowledged to be experts and leaders in their field. And they constituted a committee rather than a panel, which meant that they took corporate um, decisions and discussions. Um, the government hadn't appointed a military person for the um, inquiry, but we concluded that was essential. And um, John asked Sir Roger Wheeler, who had been the Chief of the General Staff um, until 2000, to um, become the military advisor to the committee. And we also asked Dame Rosalind Higgins, who was the president or had been the president of the International Court of Justice from 2006 to 2009, to provide advice to the inquiry on international law. They contributed to developing lines of questioning and offered their expert advice on the interpretation of evidence. Um, I should also mention that because it wasn't a statutory inquiry, um, we developed our own procedures um, and we published three protocols. Um, one very important one about the protection and uh, of information provided by the government and the process for agreeing its disclosure, one on for witnesses giving evidence and one for um, how we would conduct the hearings. We were quite a small team. Um, maximum was during the first round of hearings when there were 16 of us in total. Um, we had a legal advisor, but we didn't have any counsel to the inquiry, um, which was, um, I think, a, a, a the way, because we were a different sort of inquiry. Um, and the committee were very clear that they wanted to conduct the hearings by asking the questions themselves and getting the witness to um, reply and to um, invite them and encourage them to tell us what they thought was important as opposed to um, it being a sort of adversarial um, context and the departments provided witnesses with legal advice as appropriate. Um, in the end, it took us seven years to complete the job um, and it was quite a long report. It ran to an executive summary and 12 volumes. The computer told us it was about two and a half million words. Um, and um, I think one of the key things was in John's statement at the launch of the report, um, he summarized the key highlights in a way which I think most people who heard it thought was a very compelling um, summary of some of the key conclusions. Um, we also published transcripts of all the hearings, including the private ones with some redactions, 
and some 1,800 documents um, that we had received. We'd received about 150,000 in total. Um, and we'd also received not a huge number, but a considerable number of submissions from people who hadn't given evidence. And we published some of those where they had direct responsibilities um, or expertise on the issues being considered by the inquiry, including 37 legal submissions. Gosh, well, we've heard from Nicholas and from Margaret what a massive undertaking an inquiry can be in terms of the amount of evidence um, that you have to consider and the length of your report. Brian, as our third speaker, um, was yours a narrower inquiry? Well, um, I think yours was the shortest. I'm not entirely sure that uh, it was particularly narrow. Uh, for those um, who require reminding, on the 11th of July 2011, the Prime Minister David Cameron made a statement to the House of Commons the effect, in recent days, the whole country has been shocked by the revelations of the phone hacking scandal. What this country in the House has to confront is an episode that is frankly disgraceful. Accusations of widespread law breaking by parts of our press, alleged corruption by some police officers, and as we have just discussed, the failure of our political system over many, many years to tackle a problem that has been getting worse. We must at all times keep the real victims at the front and centre of this debate, relatives of those who died at the hands of terrorism, war heroes and murder victims, people who've already suffered in a way that we can barely imagine, have been made to suffer all over again. I believe that we all want the same thing, press, police and politicians who serve the public. With that introduction and uh, on a cross-party basis, my inquiry was set up to examine the culture, practice and ethics of the press. Uh, it was set up in two parts, uh, and I regret that I didn't emphasize the difference sufficiently. The first was to inquire into the culture, practice, and ethics of the press, including relationships between national newspapers and politicians, contacts between the press and the police, and the extent to which the current regulatory uh, framework had failed, including in relation to data protection, and the extent to which there was a failure to act on previous warnings. I was also required to make recommendations for a new, more effective policy and regulatory regime and for how future concerns about press behavior, media policy, regulation and cross-media ownership should be dealt with, as well as the future conduct of relations between politicians and the press and the future conduct of relations between the press and the police. Part two of the inquiry was deliberately separated because Parallel with my inquiry was a police investigation. Therefore, I could not investigate who did not, who did what to whom. That was going to wait for part two. But the critical part of part one was that it concerned the press, newspapers. Part two was wider and concerned the media generally. And uh, although I was much criticized later for not dealing with the internet, that's because that would have been in part two. Anyway, uh, I was asked also, interestingly enough, to report within a year. Uh, I, I didn't go back as Nicholas had to, to say this won't wash later. I did it from the outset because I decided that if I was to report within a year, because we didn't have a single piece of paper available, the police were keeping their police papers carefully separate. Uh, I was gonna have to ask a lot of people to make statements we were then going to have to examine those statements and call the evidence. Then we were going to have to conduct uh, uh, a review of that, reach con preliminary conclusions, give the opportunity to people who would be, could be criticized the chance to rebut that criticism and publish a report. So I made it clear that I would try to conclude the evidence and submissions within one year of the date of my appointment and to provide the report within one year of the date of starting the actual evidence. So I was appointed on the 28th of July, 2011. We finished, I think on the 25th of July, 2012, the final submissions. And that summer was spent dealing with uh, what we call rule 13 letters. And I'll come back to that in a moment. 
and the report was ultimately published, I'm afraid, late, two weeks late, on the 29th of November 2012. Uh, the reaction to it, uh, people will doubtless remember, it didn't entirely um, uh, meet the wishes of the press or the government, and uh, part two was, as everybody will know, ultimately cancelled. Uh, it was an inquiry under the Inquiries Act, which Baroness Hallett's inquiry would be under, and therefore it carried within it a statutory framework, which I believe in large part, but not entirely, was entirely appropriate. So I had four counsel to the inquiry, each of whom was assisted by an additional member of the bar. Uh, I had an inquiry team of about um, 15, and I had three other barristers assist in the preparation of the report. Uh, we were arranged, we arranged affairs so that we conducted our inquiry in three modules, the press and the public, the press and the police, and the press and, and, and future regulation, the press and the public being also dealing with politicians. Uh, the question of assessors or panelists was dealt with in this way. Uh, originally, the prime minister suggested panelists. I felt that if there were to be panelists, they would have to hear the entirety of the case. This couldn't be a question of coming in when you were available. So we would need people who literally could spend their full time on the inquiry. And on that basis, when I explained that to the proposed panelists who'd been uh, invited on the basis they were panelists, all of them were actually not entirely keen that they should be spending their entire lives um, doing this particular exercise. I had um, one former editor uh, who was also a previous managing director of uh, Pearson, the Financial Times, and Sir David Bell, a former regulator in Lord David Curry, uh, Shami Chakrabarti, later Baroness Chakrabarti, from, who was then at Liberty, two um, serving journalists, Eleanor Goodman from TV and George Thompson, the previous political editor of, I think, The Telegraph, and a retired uh, Chief Constable Paul Scott Lee. Uh, the challenge for assessors is that if I asked them for formal advice, that advice was going to have to be in writing and made available to everybody so they could comment upon it. Uh, we arranged for the affected people to be represented. I was keen that they be represented by one firm of solicitors uh, and the act permitted me to choose if they couldn't agree between themselves. And we uh, conducted the inquiry very much as the act identified. I can't say as uh, Lord Phillips said that not a single question was asked by anyone other than counsel, because it was. There were quite heated exchanges about the extent to which there could be cross-examination, uh, particularly by some of the uh, representatives of the press on some of the others and also by the victims on some of the editors of the press. Uh, in the main though, counsel submitted questions to counsel to the inquiry and he decided whether to ask them. On occasion I was asked when counsel decided not to ask them to permit them to be asked, but I kept it very much as an inquisitorial process, not as an adversarial process. The only concern I had about the adversarial process was there was at least one newspaper that felt I was in an adversarial process with them. Uh, so that's how I, our inquiry um, was conducted. We kept very closely to time. Uh, we identified a, a very clear um, timetable, which we stuck to. But not only did I hear witnesses in person, where I didn't think that their evidence needed further elaboration, 
I not infrequently read statements into the inquiry history without it being read. So we put them on the website. We had a website throughout the inquiry, which was updated um, daily with the evidence that was given. Our inquiry was public, not merely public, but stream so that everybody could watch. Um, I make no bones about it that I was slightly concerned about that initially, because first of all, I felt that uh, there was a risk that the, the television screens would focus on me or Robert Jay, who was counsel to my inquiry, who performed an absolutely outstanding job. Uh, or secondly, that it would permit witnesses and perhaps lawyers to grandstand a bit. And thirdly, it seemed counterintuitive to require people whose privacy had been invaded to speak again about their invasion in public. But I was persuaded that if I didn't, it would, it would not be visible. And uh, it was streamed and watched by many, many people all over the world. That was, in my view, an inspired piece of advice that I was given, and I was very pleased to do it. Now, the inquiry has been uh, the subject of uh, work by the University of Kingston and is used as a teaching tool for journalism students. Uh, far be it for me to use this opportunity to give the website a plug, but I will anyway. It's www.discoverleveson.com. And you can go to that and you can search any witness and watch them and read the transcript. You can see all the legal submissions that were made and uh, you can read the entirety of the report and search the report, which was four volumes, a small contribution compared to those of um, Nicholas and Phillips and uh, Sir John Chilcott, um, but uh, it is there. Um, I don't think it came to breaking me, but I will say this, I have never worked harder in my entire life. And I take the period both before when I was in the bar and subsequently when I was on the bench. It was um, very arduous and uh, required intense focus. Thank you, uh, all of you, for those introductions. Um, let me just say to the audience, uh, for those who missed my opening remarks, um, that questions are trickling in. Um, those of you who want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A, and we'll come to you um, in 20 minutes or so. Um, but for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to have a discussion uh, with the three speakers. Um, and I want to focus in particular about the key decisions at the start of an inquiry, because this is the stage that Heather Hallett uh, is going to be at. You've already mentioned, uh, all of you, I think, that you had a uh, wide choice uh, yourselves of who your assessors or fellow panelists were going to be. Um, but tell us a bit about negotiating the terms of reference, because that would have been key in terms of the subsequent scope of the inquiry how wide or how narrow um, your field was. Uh, I'm assuming all of you negotiated your terms of reference, but did you negotiate them up or down? Who would like to go first? Nicholas, I'll go first, I'll go yeah. first because I, I did not negotiate my terms of reference. I took them as, as I was presented with them. This was government prerogative and this is what they were asked me to do. Uh, and. With hindsight, this was probably a mistake. I should have focused much more closely on the terms of reference. But on this topic, it does seem to me absolutely critical at the outset to take a policy decision of, on the scale of the inquiry, the degree to which one is going to look at nuts and bolts. Uh, look at the Savile inquiry, which I think it took over 10 years. It was looking at, I think, basically 37 minutes of activity and examine this under a, a, a magnifying glass. Um, the length of the inquiry is going to depend quite critically on decisions taken at the outset as to what I call the scale of the investigation. And 
for those in the audience who don't know, the Savile Inquiry was into Bloody Sunday in Northern Ireland um, when civilians were killed. Um, and it took, I think, uh, 11 years and cost just short of 200 million pounds. It's been the biggest inquiry in British history. Margaret, your terms of reference. Um, our terms of reference were very broad. Um, we, as I said in my introduction, we didn't um, really negotiate on um, narrowing them down um, or expanding them. Um, we did change um, the nature of the inquiry because um, John um, made it clear he was going to hold as much as possible of it is in public, um, whereas it had originally been intended to be a private inquiry or held in private. Um, and during the course of the inquiry, um, we made it clear that we wouldn't address uh, a number of key areas. Um, the 9-11 attacks, um, the death of Dr. David Kelly, um, the handling of detainees, and individual incidents in which um, Iraqi citizens had died um, during um, the aftermath of the conflict. And um, as a matter of practice, um, we stuck with the terms of reference that we were looking at the actions of the government and we didn't go down to the sort of operational level. I think that's going to be um, a big issue for um, Lady Hallett um, because um, the consequences of the government's decisions um, affected everybody in the UK. Um, but I think that in choosing where what the terms of reference are going to be, um, I think there's a big choice to be made about whether you look at the decisions of government and the systemic issues, which is what the Iraq inquiry chose to do, and not to get pulled down into how the component parts of the system, particularly on the ground, operated. I'm not sure, um, you know, what the balance of um, opinion will be in relation to where the COVID inquiry um, should focus, because I think uh, it's a different inquiry. But I think that had we been required to look at the operational level, it would have been an even more complex. And um, I think it would have taken um, a much longer period of time. And anything to add on terms of reference? Uh, well, I think it's uh, important for the chairman to focus on the terms of reference, but it's against the background that there were many players in the decision as to what should be investigated. So this wasn't just a question of government uh, assertion. It was government discussing with the devolved administration and indeed with some of the interested um, NGOs who had been pressing for this inquiry in the first place. Uh, I am sorry that it was necessary to split up my inquiry into two because it had the effect that it had. But I have absolutely no doubt at all that the terms of reference have to be structured in a way that permit um, the analysis to be conducted in modules. Uh, in other words, that uh, I could deal with the press and the public and politicians. I could deal separately with B Sky B, which was one of the areas that I had to be concerned with, and uh, look at regulation separately. Uh, it's critical, it's, I think it would be critical for Baroness Hallett to identify where she sees the structure of her inquiry and to make sure the terms of reference permit her to examine all those areas which uh, are required to be examined. And the snag is that uh, even more so than in mine, I believe there will be a large number, and then organize herself to do so in a way that allows investigation to be conducted concurrently rather than consecutively in order not to allow the inquiry to take um, the sort of time 
that others have taken, like Chilcot, like um, Bloody Sunday. I'm not criticizing them at all, but uh, I think it's going to be difficult to keep this within reasonable bounds of time. And you talked about how to divide up uh, the subject matter into, into modules or work streams. Um, realistically, how many different lines of inquiry uh, do you think Lady Hallett can pursue simultaneously? Well, she doesn't need to pursue them all simultaneously. Um, uh, of course, it will be a matter for her. But um, I noticed that um, Sir Martin Moore Bick, Grenfell, has a number of Queen's Council who I think have been doing different things and uh, preparing different aspects of his inquiry. And it may be that that's the way for her to proceed. So she can set it up, send people off to obtain the witness statements, because of course that's an important part of the inquiry to get the people you want to make statements to make their statements and to provide them to the inquiry and have that research going on in different streams. She will start with the first while others are being prepared and then she'll be able to move on to the next one. Uh, of course, it's entirely up to her, uh, but uh, to do them consecutively, uh, finish one before starting another, I think uh, runs the risk of taking an inordinate length of time. And still staying with the start of an inquiry, how much help and advice uh, did each of you get from the cabinet office uh, when you were setting out? Or were you largely on your own, Margaret? Um, can I, before I comment on that, and you can choose who comments first on that, could I just comment on the work streams? Yes. Um, we had, um, I think, 17 work streams going simul um, concurrently during the inquiry. Oh. Um, and those were the 17 separate sections in the report. And different members of the team um, worked on those um, with the committee periodically um, looking at the analysis and um, reviewing it. Um, I think that the question of the hearings, you have to work out, um, you know, some of our witnesses um, had things to say about a multiplicity of aspects um, that we were looking at. Um, and I also think that one of the challenges um, for us, and I think it will be the same um, for Baroness Hallett, is that there will be interdependencies between the work streams and one of the challenges is working out what's cause and what is effect and what is a consequence of something and periodically standing back and looking at the interrelationships between the different work strands and whether you should look at it, um, whether it affects the way in which you look at an adjacent area of um, the inquiry. So, um, I think that's sometimes quite a challenge. And we did um, discover you do one piece of work and you'd think you'd um, got to the bottom of it. But when you looked at it in the broader context, it raised different questions. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges. Um, but I do agree that you're going to have to have concurrent work streams, um, but there might be some interrelationships. Um, while you're talking, Margaret, how much help did you get at at the start from the cabinet office uh, with advice about this kind of thing or anything else? Um, I think that I got advice and help from the cabinet office in um, two very different areas. Um, because um, we were sponsored by the cabinet office and I was in the cabinet office when we were appointed, um, I actually relied on the cabinet office to provide a great deal of practical support in terms of accommodation, and IT and finance and procurement and setting up the website and giving us a part-time comms officer, which meant that actually we could hit the ground um, running very fast. 
that's actually contrary to some of the advice um, for setting up inquiries, which said you should not be physically in the same place. We were actually in a cabinet office building, but the one that's used by the Intelligence and Security Committee and the Civil Contingencies Secretariat. So we were not in the bit of the cabinet office that was responsible for the policy or the bit of the cabinet office that was sponsoring us. Um, I think that the guidance that we got, um, uh, there was the draft guidance for um, inquiries. It's very good as a checklist of the issues that you need to think about. It's not so good on um, what conclusions you might draw. Um, and because we were a Privy Council inquiry, um, uh, the most useful thing that we had was that John had sat on another Privy Council inquiry um, and that I had um, several conversations with the person who'd been the secretary um, to the um, WMD inquiry. Um, but really, um, apart from knowing the sorts of areas that you needed to consider, working out how you did it um, was left to us. Nicholas, what advice did you get from the Cabinet Office? I don't think I got any advice from the Cabinet Office at all. And, and at the beginning of the inquiry, it, it, it occurred to me that there ought to be a handbook for anyone who's asked to conduct an inquiry, and there wasn't one. Um, my, my inquiry was, was not a, a government inquiry as such, it was more a ministerial inquiry. The Minister of Ag Ministry of Agriculture, the Department of Health, Wales, Northern Ireland, I had to report to the ministers, uh, and I was left to get on with it. And Margaret O'Brien, do you know whether such a handbook exists now? Well, uh, as I understand, I was certainly uh, asked about this, and I know that um, we were prepared to help update Cabinet Office guidance. Um, I think it may still be work in progress, uh, which is a great shame because I entirely agree with uh, Lord Phillips, this every chairman should not have to reinvent the wheel. But um, there, there, there it is. Uh, as regards assistance, I was assisted by, I had many, many meetings. Um, this was not just on the terms of reference, but all aspects with the Director General of Propriety and Ethics, who is of course in the news now, um, Sue Gray, the Treasury Solicitor, um, the late Sir Paul Jenkins, and a director from uh, the, I, I think she was then at the Cabinet Office, but I had known her at the Ministry of Justice. And uh, I was also assisted by um, a civil servant from the Judicial Office, who became an invaluable member of my uh, team. Uh, and uh, we discussed not merely the terms of reference, but all aspects of the inquiry. I was very keen that it should be conducted at the Royal Court of Justice, which it was. And uh, uh, people will remember that a, um, a marquee was put up outside um, for an overflow of visitors, which was frequently quite full, occasionally not so full. Um, but uh, they certainly provided that assistance for me setting it up. But a lot of the challenges we simply had to face on the way. Well, I know there are quite a lot of people from the Cabinet Office um, attending this seminar. Um, so perhaps if they need help in drawing up the handbook, um, they could turn to the three of you. There are questions uh, coming in fast and I'll come to the audience uh, in just five minutes time. Let me uh, ask one more question. Um, coming to the, as it were, the middle of your inquiry um, and beginning to see the end in sight and being interested in government and parliament, uh, taking an interest in your work. Tell me, did you have any contact with government or parliament, formally or informally, during the course of the inquiry to try and keep them interested or did you keep them rigorously at arm's length? Nicholas, would you like to go first on this one? Well, I, I think I um, said at the outset that I wanted to talk to the Minister of Agriculture to find out his objectives from this inquiry, and he wouldn't speak to me. 
And there was a, a kind of deliberate wall kept between government uh, and um, my inquiry because the, the government was a Labour government and it was inquiring into the adequacy of the response of its predecessor and felt very, very sensitive indeed uh, as to any suggestion that there was political motivation. And, and so they wanted to leave me to get on with it entirely uh, without any kind of influence. Um, initially, I was told the inquiry would be in the Ministry of Agriculture building, but we rejected that um, as not being appropriate uh, and held it in a, a rather interesting building on the South Bank, close to Waterloo Station. Margaret, did you try and uh, keep Whitehall warm, as it were, for your findings as they began to develop? Um, I think that we kept the Cabinet Office and the Prime Minister um, informed of um, the stages of the inquiry. Um, and we used our website um, to make um, statements about what we intended to do and when. Um, we used it to publish exchanges um, with the Prime Minister and with the Cabinet Secretary. Um, and we used it during the hearings to publicize um, the timetable and the arrangements for people to um, come and see the um, hearings in person, particularly families. Um, and of course, like um, Lord Levis, uh, the Leveson inquiry, um, we did stream all our hearings, the public hearings live. Um, but John was very clear that he wasn't going to provide a running commentary. And although he maintained a dialogue and responded to letters from um, MPs and members of the House of Lords, and indeed he gave evidence to the Foreign Affairs Committee on um, in February 2015. Um, but he was very clear that what he was discussing was the process, not the substance. And um, uh, given the sensitivity of the ground we were covering, um, I think we were very careful not to um, disclose our thinking until the report was finished. Brian, anything to add? Um, not really. Of course, um, the prime, the all relevant prime ministers, and that now I can look back is five and includes Lady May, um, gave evidence to my inquiry and as did a number of ministers. Um, I did not keep uh, the government informed as to my progress. I treated it very much as a judicial inquiry um, and nobody sought to undermine that. There was one incident, but uh, which was coped with and led to my giving a judgment. Um, but no, I, whether, whether um, uh, there were behind the scenes discussions, not as to what I was deciding, because that certainly was never discussed, but as to progress, I, I, I can't say. But nothing that I know of, um, other than that uh, we kept an arm's length. And indeed, our arm's length was sufficiently clear that the government were given 24 hours with the report before it was announced. The opposition were given a copy of the report on the morning that it was announced, that it was announced and I announced it at one o'clock in the afternoon. So um, we, we kept ourselves pretty much to ourselves. Very good. Uh, now, forgive us, everyone in the audience, especially those of you who ask questions. Um, it's now your turn. Um, I can see 15 questions in the Q&A. Um, Abby, let's take them, if we can, in groups of three. Um, and panel, can you keep your replies as crisp as possible? You don't have to answer all three questions in each round. But Abby, give us the first round. Sure. So Bernard asks, what steps should be taken to protect the interests of witnesses whose reputation may be damaged either by the findings of the inquiry or by the courts of public opinion? And then second question, John asked, did any of our speakers form the impression that relevant documents were not always disclosed to them? And if so, were there any tools that uh, were available to force disclosure or explanation? 
And then David asks, can the COVID inquiry be time limited? Uh, he doubts that the public opinion public would want to wait years for a publication. Nicholas, would you like to go first? Yes, yes, I would. Um, it's very important uh, for the tribunal to have in mind uh, the reputation of witnesses. And it's very hard for the man in the street to appreciate just how much stress is involved on giving evidence in one of these inquiries. And if there's a possibility that you're going to be criticized, it can actually domin dominate the life of the individual witnesses. And so you've got to be very, very sensitive. And if, if you are going to criticize them, uh, then as a matter of fairness, you've got to put them on notice so that they can deal with this. And, and this is a very dangerous element of an inquiry because it can result in uh, an enormous amount of time being involved. Because once a witness is, uh, perceives himself or herself as under threat, the attitude changes to one of trying to help the inquiry find out the facts to trying to defend oneself. Um, and so the, the, there's less objectivity in, in what is being provided. And the way we dealt with it, as I said, was to have stage one devoted simply to finding facts without giving any warnings to anybody. And only when we've got the factual evidence did we then send letters saying, in the light of the evidence we've received, there's a possibility that you might be criticized about this or that and invite them, give them a chance to come uh, and deal with that potential criticism. Margaret. Did you have difficulties with documents not being disclosed? Uh, can I say something about reputation first? Yes, um, which is to agree that this is an extremely um, difficult area. And um, it is one where our protocol said that if they were going to be criticised in a hearing, which were mainly um, exploratory, then we would um, give them notice, which we did. Um, but rather like uh, Lord Phillips, um, most of the criticism came when we came to drafting the report. And because we didn't hold hearings at that stage, that was done in correspondence. So was, they, our protocols for the witnesses said that they would be given draft sections of the report and the evidence underpinning it um, in order to comment. Um, and that was in the sort of later phases of the inquiry. I think on the relevant documents, I think that's a really important issue because um, we had access to anything that we asked for um, and in terms of categories of information and um, because we were a Privy Council inquiry and I cannot say that there was any occasion where we suspected a document was withheld. Sometimes documents couldn't be found um, immediately, sometimes documents couldn't be found at all. But I don't think there was any dis deliberate withholding of information. I think that that was really important because the nature of our inquiry, and I think nat the nature of aspects of the COVID inquiry, is going to be about the conduct of government business. And being having access to the um, documents provides insights um, that you might not realise. And I think that the process of having to ask for witness statements and then um, asking for documents, rather than saying, give me everything that's relevant, which is what we did, uh, and then we made the selection of what was material, um, I think is quite a, an interesting one. And John said at the end of every oral hearing, um, we'll be comparing what you've told us with the information that we hold. And I think one of the key conclusions was that almost everybody has a partial picture. You get from a witness what do they know, um, but they probably won't know everything. Um, and in the case of the Iraq inquiry, some witnesses knew very little. Uh, and they give evidence on the basis of their knowledge, their experience and their frame of reference, which might not be the right context in which to look at it. Um, so I think this is a really critical issue um, for the COVID inquiry. Thank you. Brian, anything to add? We haven't answered the third question about yeah, can yes. it be time limited. Uh, let me just um, deal with that first and then make one comment on one of the other questions. Uh, I made the point that I couldn't do the inquiry in a year. And if you think about it, if you start without a single piece of paper um, on day one and you've got to get the, the witness statements and all their factual material, then you've got to read it all 
and uh, analyze it yourself. Then you've got to decide who you want to call. Then you, when you've finished all that, you've got to give the chance for uh, members to make submit to interested parties to make submissions. Then you've got to do the Rule 13 exercise, the reputational question, which uh, both have spoken of, and I'll mention again in a moment. And then you've got to finish your report. So I reckon that if I had to do it in a year, I wouldn't be able to start. Remember, 28th of July, when I was appointed, people go on holiday. I wouldn't be able to start before the beginning of November. In fact, actually, I put that back two weeks, the 15th of November. And if I had to finish by the 28th of July 2012, I was going to have to conclude the evidence by the end of March or mid-April uh, to deal with everything. And that gave only a very small window actually to hear the evidence. So I think given the size of the COVID inquiry, I think anybody that thinks that this is going to be done quickly is under a grave misillusion. Um, let me just talk a little bit about Rule 13, which I mentioned it in, the, um, in my original remarks. The rules, the Inquiry Act rules, require um, those who may be the subject of criticism to be given notice of A, the nature of the criticism, B, the facts on which the nature of that criticism relies, and C, the evidence upon which reliance is based to reach the facts, to reach the conclusion. Um, I decided that would be, that would take me forever. So what I did, and I had a hearing about it and gave a judgment, which is available on our website, saying what I would do is identify the nature of the criticism and then provide hyperlinks to the evidence of the witnesses that, as it were, provide evidence to justify that criticism. And we sent out a large number of these Rule 13 letters, which took an inordinate amount of effort and work and then had to wait for the response. And the responses came in. And I don't mind making it abundantly clear that I can vividly remember um, a number of changes that were made as a consequence of the responses. And one person in particular, who I had been minded to criticize, I did not criticize as a result of the, of the representations made. But Lord Phillips is quite right. The consequence is that as soon as you turn the dial that way, you move from assistance to defence. So you're saying, in effect, no shortcuts there? I'm afraid not. Yeah. And that's only fair. Yes. In the next round, if we may, I'll come to you in reverse order. So it'll be Brian, Margaret, Nicholas. Uh, Abby, give us the next three questions, please. Sure. So Frankie asks, were you supported by a team responsible for briefings, research, admin duties, etc.? And where did you source these staff? Mike asks, I am wondering whether the remit of the COVID inquiry will include looking at the financial measure, measures taken by government and the Bank of England. And Jonathan asks, how might the COVID inquiry deal with existing public body reports, e.g. from Select Committee National Order Office? Should it reopen these issues or give their findings some weight? Brian, would you like to go first? Certainly, um, and I'm delighted to try and answer the first question. Um, I've told you the size of my team. We had, and that included the legal team as well, uh, because the, my lawyers were not independent lawyers. They were part of the government legal service. So I had a team of half a dozen or so lawyers, half a dozen or so civil servants who were researchers. Um, and then half a dozen or so people who, as it were, provided the administrative support. And they were headed by a former director general um, within the civil service. Um, but each of those three teams had a deputy director responsible for running that team. Um, the, so the legal team, the administrative support team and the research team. And the administrative team not only uh, made sure I was up to date, but liaised with the witnesses, uh, they all did a frankly admirable job. And I could not have managed the inquiry without it. They then changed jobs as 
we were writing to help with um, the logistics of putting the report together um, to such extent that at nine o'clock on Friday evening, two members of the team were literally at the printers waiting for, to, for me to agree that they could press the machine to start the print running going. So absolutely, and that, that assistance is critical. Margaret. Um, well, um, I was in charge of the support team um, for the uh, Iraq inquiry. And as I said, we had um, a total of 16, um, which was um, me, two deputies, a legal advisor, six policy analysis, six support staff, and then actually two part-time press offices during um, the hearings and at publication. Um, I had to find those team members myself with the exception of the legal advisor, um, where uh, as um, has been mentioned before, uh, the then Treasury solicitor was very helpful um, in terms of providing me with, um, in the end, two people who fulfilled that role sequentially. Um, it's quite hard work finding the right people to do that. Um, and that's something else where I think there's scope for um, doing things better. I think I'll pause on whether it should be, um, the inquiry should look at financial measures because I think that's an issue for the inquiry. Um, I would however like to comment on the, um, should they take existing um, reports by public bodies? We had access to quite a lot of that um, for the Iraq inquiry. And I think that you can look at it and you can um, ask yourself whether you agree you form the same conclusions on the same evidence. And I think John is on record as saying uh, that Butler didn't have all the information that we had in relation to um, weapons of mass destruction. Um, and I think um, nor did the Foreign Affairs Committee who looked at similar things, nor had the Intelligence and Security Committee. So I think the question is, did they have access to um, all the relevant information? Um, so I don't think it's reopening it. I think it's a question of, did they have all the information you got? And do you reach the same conclusions? Nicholas, anything to add? Uh, well, um, so far as the team is concerned, my task was in a, a, a little bit different. It was a, a hindsight task. Did the government respond adequately to the emergence of BSE and the emergence of the human equivalent? Uh, what government did was in a matter of public record, what they said and what they did by way of regulations and so on. Uh, what we needed to know was what went on within government by way of communications, decision taking and so on. Uh, that in one way was a fairly narrow task, but it involved an enormous amount of documentation. So the real task was looking at documents, not too difficult to identify what you were looking at once you, you read the documents. So we had an enormous team, I think up to 50 young people working away at this, uh, but it didn't call for great expertise at, at, at that stage. Um, now, one of the things we did look at very closely was the advice that had been given to government because they set up committees, scientific committees to advise, is BSE going to be transmissible? Uh, and we looked at that and we, in fact, criticised one of the committees. Um, they weren't pleased about that. Uh, I think if, if government has been informed by independent committees, you, you can't avoid looking at uh, what they were advised. Indeed. Uh, we've got half a dozen more questions um, and we're coming into our last 10 minutes. Let's see if we can get through two more rounds. So, Abby, three more questions, please. Okay, so Jonathan asks, how will the COVID inquiry be able to define the scope of decisions that need to be considered? And then Bernard asks, is there a case for a standing inquiry office to be set up at arm's length from government in order to develop consistent practices in the conduct of such inquiries? And then Richard asks, after listening to the fact that information given to the public about BSE was wrong, does the panel feel that potential instances of this will be addressed in the COVID inquiry? And he references the idea that the virus came from China um, that was dismissed at the, at the beginning. Very good. Um, this time let's go Margaret uh, and then Lord Phillips and then, and then Brown. Margaret. Um, I think that um, if it's going to have public confidence, then I think that 
um, the inquiry will need to look at what the public were told by the government and whether it was um, correct or not. And I think that it will have to be, um, you know, decide which areas it's going to do that in. But I think another for me would be um, the nature of the disease and how it's transmitted. Um, which I think is something um, where the question is what, you know, what did the government know? What were the public um, told? Um, I think that's something that might be a legitimate area for the inquiry. I think that there has been a long running debate about whether there should be a standing inquiry office. And in a sense, that's the function of the team in the cabinet office, which sits in the propriety and ethics area, um, which is meant to be the, um, the guardian of the guidance and the repository of information. Individual departments were also running a number of um, inquiries um, also can do something here. And I think the Home Office um, a few years ago decided to have a team in the Home Office which sponsored all the inquiries that the Home Office um, was responsible for rather than having it run from the individual um, policy areas in the Home Office. And I think that was an opportunity to um, pool learning and experience. Um, but, you know, if you have a standing team, their experience is going to be um, dependent on what happens while they're in post. And I think that's quite difficult. So I think I, I would argue for something more flexible, which is about how do you actually look at what expertise is available and make sure that you pull on it um, as and when necessary. Um, although I do agree, as we discussed earlier, that um, there's a, a question about whether or not the Cabinet Office guidance does need to be finalised and published, um, which is something the House of Lords recommended in 2015. Um, I think that on the first question, can you remind me of the first question, Abby? I think defining the scope. We covered it. it was about defining the scope and we had a discussion about terms of reference. Yes. So uh, forgive me, let's move on. Nicholas, anything to add? I'd like to say something about the scope of the COVID inquiry. It seems to me that there's so many different aspects of the COVID story, it is simply not possible to combine them all in a single inquiry. You could have a long listing inquiry in the grant of contracts for providing masks, flow tests, and so on. That, that could be a quite long running inquiry in its own right. So it does seem to me that probably some decisions are going to have to be taken as to whether there aren't some aspects of the COVID story that will simply have to be excluded from the inquiry. I don't know, but I think to try and look into everything thoroughly would take 20 years. Brian. Uh, yes, the, I agree that there are gonna to have to be decisions as to the scope. Um, I'm, I think that that's going to be rather driven by the areas which have caused real public concern. So I think there's a great scientific exercise to be undertaken. I, I think it's going to be quite difficult to avoid dealing with the PPE issue that Lord Phillips just mentioned. Um, however, I, speaking for myself, to go beyond that to Wuhan and the, the question that arose, I think is out with the inquiry because that's not based upon evidence that will be obtainable from within this country. So I think there are some areas which can be excluded. As regards a standing committee, I do believe that it is important to have expertise in this area. And there are civil servants who have expertise, um, but at the core, those responsible for running an inquiry must have complete confidence in the team that they have around them. And that requires them to know them and to at least to be to, to know and have had perhaps earlier uh, dealings with at least some of the team so that they can feel that they've got complete confidence that, that, that everybody is marching along to the same drumbeat. I certainly have that advantage. Now, I'm coming into our last five minutes and we have three questions left. Um, so let's quickly uh, uh, have those from Abby. Um, and if you would, panel, quick answers, please. Abby. Sure, so Catherine asks, what were the biggest successes of each inquiry? And then are there any risks government uses these to push issues into the long grass? 
David asks, the COVID inquiry is not just about public policy and operational activity. A large part will be scientific and medical, uh, much of which is controversial, and this may pose a challenge. What would the panel advise? broad question and then Ewan asked how did the panelists find different people classify what was evidence he finds many often confuse it with proof and let's uh, go in the order if we can Nicholas and then Margaret and then Brian um I think the biggest success of, of my inquiry was guidance given uh, a, a, as to how to communicate to the public uh, I did think we did affect quite a change uh, to the approach of what would be said to the public in areas where there was uncertainty and risk. Thank you. Margaret. Um, I think our biggest success was producing something that was widely recognized as being a reliable account of what had happened um, and which put to rest a huge area of controversy. Um, I think whether the lessons it identified have been learned, I think, um, time will tell, and I think that some of the lessons will be, it, the COVID inquiry will show whether they were learned or not, particularly about how decisions are made and advice is taken and challenge is um, given to advice. I think that, um, interestingly, the announcement of the inquiry said that there would be a panel of, um, a panel will be appointed in the new year. I think there's an issue there about whether or not um, it's a panel or expert advisors and whether they can cover things like um, scientific and medical issues. And on the evidence point, um, indeed, uh, we were very clear that we would only have evidence from people who had direct responsibilities. Um, everything else was uh, expert opinion or just opinion. Um, people, it, they were legitimate um, and in offering us opinions, but it wasn't evidence. And I think that's quite a, an important point. Right, we have the last let me, word. Let me, let me focus on the um, science question. Uh, I think that this inquiry is going to need to access the highest level of scientific knowledge. And the challenge that Baroness Hallett has is that many, if not most, of the leading scientists in public health, in epidemiology, in statistics, will have been involved either with SAGE or with the independent SAGE or as commentators. And finding sufficient expertise that is not in any sense conflicted, that has an open mind, I think will provide a real challenge. Um, uh, I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm sure it is possible, but that's going to be a challenge because, as I said at the very beginning, one of the difficulties if you just have assessors is that then those who have the opportunity to make submissions must know the, the evidence upon which you are likely to make an assessment. That's only fair. So if you are then asking them for um, material, then you're going to have to disclose it. And uh, as I say, that's what I agreed to do. In the end, I did not ask for formal advice, and I used my assessors for a slightly different, in a slightly different way. But that's one of the challenges that Baroness Hallett is going to have to face. Thank you. Um, it is now just past 6.15. We must draw this to a close. Before I thank the speakers, uh, let me just give uh, two trailers for future seminars. Uh, first, very relevant to what we've just been discussing at the end. Next month, on the 24th of February, our seminar is titled Three Sages, and we have three members of the government's uh, scientific advice committee to government talking about scientific advice the government during the COVID inquiry. Uh, that's on the 24th of February. Next week, uh, our seminar next Thursday uh, is going to be about addressing climate change through policy and art. Uh, there's the slide about it, shared by my colleague, Elisa Cagliari. Um, but finally, um, let me just say three words of thanks. Thank you, the audience, uh, for your excellent questions. Thank you, Abby. Uh, for collating them. But most of all, uh, let me give thanks to our three speakers for having devoted years of their lives 
to the major in public inquiries they were involved in. And you have heard um, just how arduous uh, that is. So as I said at the beginning, um, we should all salute Lady Hallett for taking on this hugely important task. Um, and thank you all of you for having been willing to join us uh, for just over an hour to share your collective wisdom uh, and experience. So thank you, Lord Phillips. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Sir Brown. Thank you, all of you. And good night. Abby, a drum roll, please.